Okay, so um, um, in this video, I want to talk a little bit about efficiency. Um, we started talking a little bit about this in class. You have some experience with this. Um, but the idea, the mathematical quantitative idea here is that at least for energy, and this can be transplanted to any other kind of efficiency, it's the amount of stuff that, uh, that goes in um, and compare that to the amount of stuff, of stuff that comes out, right? So the amount of energy that comes out that is contained and usable compared or over divided by the amount of energy that was put into the system is our efficiency, but if we're trying to get to a percentage, we're going to multiply that by 100. And that's really going to be key, is that because theoretically, um, because, so I'm going to make a little note here, because of the conservation of energy, that the energy going in is going to equal the energy coming out, we should have 100% efficiency if we're in an ideal situation. But sometimes, some of the energy is actually lost, quote unquote lost, and we don't, we can't capture all that energy back as a usable form. And sometimes we lose it to the system, um, or in other words, to heat or to sound or light. Um, <clears throat> and so we don't get 100% efficiency. So what I want you to really kind of think about is that the energy on this side and the energy on this side are equal to each other in reality. It's just that it's not always usable to us. So um, what I'm going to do here is kind of break this down a little bit. So the energy going in um, is going to be the kinetic energy plus the potential energy, um, and that's going to be equal to the kinetic energy and potential energy um, that comes out. And that that is another word saying E total, right? Because E total equals the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. We can put that the E total equals the E total. In other words, these two these two sides are true. Um, it's just that some of the energy gets transformed into non-usable forms for us. So um, what I, what I want to do is actually break this down even further in that EK is made up of several different kinds of energy. Remember that we've got, um, we've, well, I'll, I'll put this here. Um, we've got our motion energy for kinetic energy, right? Um, we've got thermal, we've got electrical, and we have, <clears throat> um, sound or light right so all those are the four types and that's true those are going to be the same four types over here right i'm going to just abbreviate the motion thermal electrical and sound or light and i want you to actually write those out but um this is what really what's going to make up all this kinetic energy and for the potential energy we have some other kinds right so for potential energy we've got our gravitational energy or energy due to the height of an object, we have um, elastic, we have um, chemical, and we have nuclear, right? And that's the case over here as well. So gravitational, electrical, chemical, and nuclear. And so the quantities, the total quantity of energy on the input on the left side is equal to the output, but it's just going to move to these different forms through those reactions. And that's going to be kind of kind of critical to um, <clears throat> this next thing. So in addition to efficiency, the other thing that we're going to talk a little bit about here is cell respiration, right? So we're going to take this idea, we're just introducing this idea of cell respiration, which is really the process. So it's the process of converting organic molecules into usable energy, right? So, <clears throat> so what I want you to, to realize is that what we're talking about here, so these organic molecules we're talking about is chemical potential energy, chemical potential energy, into something else that we can use, which is also chemical 
potential energy. So it's just a matter of changing it from one molecule to another. But that molecule that we're talking about here is ATP, which is critical for your proteins to function. So if we're to think about this a little bit more, um, the organic molecules that I was talking, that I was just mentioning, <clears throat> this is, I'm going to label this as aerobic cellular respiration. And again, this is really what your body does with the, the food that you consume, right? So um, what we're going to do is kind of color code these a little bit. So over on the left, on for the reactants, we have glucose or some other kind of carbohydrate that you might be consuming, or even a lipid, plus oxygen gas that you breathe in, that will then... And this is just the overall reaction. There are <clears throat> certainly um, intermediate things that we'll learn more about. It's converted into carbon dioxide, water, and um, ATP, right? So that's really, really important. And what I'm going to do real quick is <clears throat> make a uh, quick aside for <clears throat> understanding these uh, energy transformation. So bear with me just one second. So what I've done here is written out the reaction for photosynthesis, just the general one and the reaction for cellular respiration. And what I want you to realize is that they're actually kind kind of reverse reactions. So for photosynthesis, we've got carbon dioxide and water with the energy of light is going to be transformed into this chemical potential energy of glucose or some other carbohydrate or lipid and oxygen gas. But cellular respiration takes those products of photosynthesis, the glucose and the oxygen, uses them as reactants, and then converts them back into carbon dioxide and water, which are some of our reactants for photosynthesis, and gives us chemical potential energy of ATP. And so if you were to think about things that are, you know, again, we've talked about canceling things out, but let's make sure we've got the right number of molecules on each side. So to balance this reaction out, we've got six carbon dioxide, six waters, one glucose and six CO2, six O2s. Again, we've got one glucose, six oxygen, six CO2, six waters, and something like 36 or 38 ATP, depending on what we're talking about. And that's a lot of energy molecules. Um, so what I want you to realize is that we can cancel some of this stuff out. So if I've got glucose over here, let's cancel glucose out. We've got six oxygens, let's cancel out six oxygens. That's six waters, cancel out six waters, six CO2, six CO2. And really what we see here is that the light energy is getting transformed into chemical potential energy, right? So now again, here's a transformation of energy. And in the middle of this, in the middle, in the middle of all this, it has to get converted into something else in the middle, right? So it's going to get converted into glucose, or C6H12O6. Um, and, and that's just an intermediate. But along that whole process, it is not 100% efficient, okay? So whenever we process these molecules, we're going to, quote unquote, lose some energy. And when we lose that energy, we don't, we're not capturing it all as ATP because some of it oops sorry about that some of it comes off as heat okay some of it comes off as heat which is um, critically important because it's helping us maintain our internal body temperature um, but it is an inefficient system because this is heat that we cannot recapture as a source of energy um, it allows us to operate more at optimal levels but it's not recapturable so what I want to do is actually extend this one more step here. I realize I'm approaching 10 minutes, but I hope that you bear with me. You can bear with me and um, extend your thinking just a little bit more. So what I'm drawing here is an energy pyramid. And it's a little slanted, but um, I hope that you can forgive that. So what we have here is 
an energy pyramid with different levels. And you may have learned of energy pyramids before, but really what this energy pyramid is doing is allowing us to um, illustrate, so I'll label this as an energy pyramid. Energy pyramid. It allows us to illustrate um, the amount of available energy in a food chain. Okay? In a food chain. So let me just make up a food chain here. And I want you to pay attention to the way that I draw my arrows. Um, oh, what is that color? Okay. So if we went from grass to rabbits, notice that the arrow is pointing to rabbits because that's the flow of where the food and energy is going. So it's not that the rabbits eat the grass, it's that the energy from the grass is going into the rabbits. Then it may go into, uh, let's say, snakes. And then it may go into hawks. Okay? So that's, an, that's a food chain, but of course we know that it's a little bit more complicated. Snakes don't only eat rabbits, so we really have a food web. But let's just use this as our model here. So at the bottom of our food chain, we would put grass. We'd, then we put rabbits, snakes, and hawks. And as with the shape of a pyramid, you'd see that there's less energy. Um, in that food chain or in that energy pyramid. Now the unit we use in an energy pyramid um, should make sense to you here now. We talk about not joules but kilojoules or thousand joules um, per meter squared. So it's the amount of energy that's produced in a given amount of area, right? It's a squared function. And then every year. Right, so so how much energy is made in a certain amount of area every year? And that's the unit that we use. We know that joules are a measure of energy now. Um, and so what we see is that there's less energy as we move up. And one of three reasons that I want you to ask me about the other two, one of the three reasons that there's less energy available to the rabbits than there is in the grass, or less energy for the snakes than there was in the rabbits, is that each of these have lost energy as heat, right? So these organisms have to still function on their own energy. And so in doing so, in order to make ATP, which is key, we're going to talk lots and lots about ATP, it also produces heat. And that heat escapes into the atmosphere, perhaps out into space, um, and um, cannot be moved up the food chain. And really, when we talk about what is available to move from one trophic or food level, from one level to the next, it's only 10%, right? So only 10% of the available energy for grass moves to rabbits. And then 10% of that moves up, and then which is a hundredth, or right, it's 1%. And then 0.1% of the original is moving up to the next level. So that's also another 10%. So we call this the rule of 10. And it's because of this inefficiency in making ATP, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just means that our energy, we lose that energy because we cannot capture it back into the system. Okay? Um, I'm going to stop there because I'm at 14.